So welcome everybody. Uh, this is the second session that we're having in these um, coronavirus webinars that we're calling Revisioning the New Normal. The first one went so great with Dr. Ellis, where we learned a lot about the, um, the coronavirus itself. And we had an opportunity to you know, discuss and there were so many questions, we weren't even able to get to all of them. We had over 60 people participating. And I'm seeing now that there's over 70, uh, there's about 70 people exactly right now. So um, this has clearly been something that people have been enjoying. Um, the recordings are also posted. I think most people with the school have gotten the links as a, there's a link on the website that lists the previous sessions along with the videos and then some other information and then the future sessions that will be planned. Um, so for example, the next one that we have scheduled will be um, will be on July 21st and that's with Dr. Luca. Um, it's titled Mask or No Mask, Coffee or No Coffee, Navigating the Complicated Maze of Scientific Information. So it's gonna be a really cool opportunity to sort of talk about how do we make sense of all this information that's constantly being thrown at us about coronavirus, but it's really applicable. I think that's the idea, applicable to how we approach learning about other topics as well. But today we're fortunate enough to have Dr. Dian Ho presenting the ethics and rationality of saving the world, some basic problems in confronting the pandemic. So uh, Dr. Ho, he's a professor of philosophy and healthcare ethics, and he also is the director of the healthcare humanities um, major now, right? Just became a major officially. Yeah, I am, uh, I am a part creator, part of, sorry, part and creator. executive yes. director per se. Yes. Yep. <laughs> um, so, um, and I think this is one of the great things about these webinars. It's an opportunity to show the sort of diversity of expertise that we have at the school in general. So we were learning from a biologist last time, now we're learning from a philosopher today. Um, so without further ado, I guess I'll turn it over to Dr. Ho. Thank you so much for having me. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be a tall order to um, follow Christo's lead. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, please excuse the fact that I'm uh, doing a PowerPoint presentation. I generally don't like them, but um, can you see the presentation okay? Yep, looks good. Great. Um, so what I want to talk about today is actually fairly um, uh, broad, broad base. Um, I want to talk more about, um, I, I wanna zoom out first and talk about uh, existential threats and um, and then kind of zoom back in to talk about pandemics and I think the reason is one of the major reason is that I think we can learn a lot about how to handle existential threats in general and then maybe some of the lessons can be ported from one domain one crisis to another so here we go um, so what are existential threat and catastrophic threat um, the report for by the Commission for human future in 2020 uh, define existential threat as one that menaces human civilization in general. Um, I actually don't like that particular definition because it's not telling. For one thing, uh, menaces, exactly what do we mean by that? Um, I am, uh, give me one second, I'm just gonna check something. Um, okay, sorry, I'm just, the chat is just popping up on me. Um, I like this modification that I made is what I'll call a dramatic and sustained lowering of the quality of life for a substantial portion of human beings and other sentient animals. I think it's important to recognize that you could have existential and catastrophic threats, not just for us, but for um, sentient creatures in general. It might not be horrible for us, but it might be terrible for them. So those kind of considerations should be folded in. Um, the person who is uh, well known for working on some of these issues is um, a guy named Nick Bostrom um, at Oxford. He was a former colleague of my at Yale years and years ago. And I particularly like this way that he frames it. He called an existential threat one where an adverse outcome would either annihilate Earth's originating intelligent life or permanently and drastically curtail its potential. And this grid here, I think is a nice way of looking at it. Um, on the left side, you have the scope of the disaster. And on the bottom, you have the intensity of the disaster. So the scope of the problem here, you can think in terms of personal, local, and global, and intensity, it's gonna be endurable and terminal. Um, so for example, your car being stolen is a endurable personal uh, disaster, but it doesn't rise to the level of a existential threat for humanity in general. As you go up the scale, you can think in terms of how many people, um, how many sentient being it affects, so thinning of the ozone layer, um, climate change are gonna be global issues. And of course, the question of intensity, it's gonna depend on 
um, whether it is something that we can recover, whether the intensity is acute or spread out over a long period of time. And you can think of existential threat in general as being both terminal and global. So it's up here. Um, the current pandemic probably doesn't rise to the level of an existential threat. A catastrophic threat, on the other hand, is somewhere between endurable and terminal, but it's global. So it's somewhere over here. Um, uh, I would say uh, the plague, for example, that ravaged the world for an extended period of time was catastrophic, but not existential. It was not terminal. The current pandemic probably would be closer to over here in terms of intensity, but it's global. Uh, that is not to diminish the, um, the, the harm done by the current pandemic. Uh, much of it is beyond just mo mo mortality and morbidity. It also involves us seeing um, other people differently, cultural um, impact, economic, social impacts that are likely long lasting. So for anyone who has actually um, been to places where they had confronted uh, epidemics before, um, you can see that there is a fundamental change in the culture that um, really changed the way the place um, uh, behaves. Um, I, I almost like to think of it as like New York City um, after 9-11. New York City was never the same after 9-11. Um, so what are some of the examples of um, existential threats? Uh, here are some. So the Commission for Human Future lists 10 existential threats. Um, decline of natural resources, especially water. So water security, access to water is clearly an existential threat. Um, and uh, we have then um, collapse of ecosystem that support life, mass extinction of species, human population growing beyond sustainability. So if um, uh, population growth continues, at some point, of course, we'll deplete all available resources on the planet because it's a closed system. Uh, global warming and climate change, uh, universal pollution, pollution that affects not just one particular area, but uh, massively change um, the ecosystem of the entire world. Pandemic of new and untreatable diseases, um, rising food insecurity, nuclear arms and WMD, that, those are our obvious ones. Um, the advent of powerful and controlled technology. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, and this is an interesting one, uh, national and global failure to understand and act. This is more like a meta level um, existential threat. It's a threat about those threats that we are unable to confront and appreciate these threats properly. So Bostrom's, Nick Bostrom has this list and he distinguished different kinds of existential threats. So the bang list, bang existential threats are those that come suddenly and are severe. So here is partly his list, um, international or accidental misuse of, in, intentional or accidental misuse of nanotechnology. So imagine that you're releasing some nanobot to clean up a um, oil spill and those nanobots are supposed to consume the carbon and then uh, peacefully uh, disintegrate. But they don't do that. They end up just consuming carbon and replicating on their own. That would be a disaster. Uh, nuclear holocaust, of course. Uh, badly programmed artificial intelligence. Um, imagine that artificial intelligence actually uh, um, lands in an area not unlike Terminator. That would be a disaster for us. But it doesn't have to be killing robots. It could be um, uh, artificial intelligence that control everything from self-driving cars to our power grid. Uh, biological agents that are intentionally or unintentionally released. Um, and Bostrom has this um, uh, item called something unforeseen, just some terrible things that happens. It's a catch-all of things that we did not anticipate. Naturally, naturally occurring diseases. Uh, physics disasters is interesting. Imagine that you're running a particle accelerator and unbeknownst to you, um, the accelerator actually causes um, some disastrous physics um, phenomenon, you know, generating a black hole, for example, that would be very bad. So far that hasn't happened, but there's no reason to believe that it couldn't happen. There's nothing in principle that's impossible. Uh, asteroid and comet impact, that's a, a legitimate concern. And so far we have very little in terms of preparation and response if a, a uh, catastrophic event of the sort were to occur. Uh, runaway global warming, that of course is fairly obvious and real. And the last one, for those who are into the simulation hypothesis, we get turned off. So for people who don't know the simulation hypothesis, that's a hypothesis that says we are actually a part of a giant simulation 
Um, and that um, you might think it's funny, you might think it's out there, but it's actually taken pretty seriously by, um, by physicists these days. NSF, I think, funded their first grant to study the simulation hypothesis a few years ago. And if you think um, being shut off is a bad thing, then the simulation hypothesis uh, being true and us getting turned off would be would be very bad. It would be um, annihilation of, of our um, our existence. But for this talk, uh, however uh, sad all these topics might be, I'm going to focus primarily on pandemics. Um, but it's important to remember that these existential threats are interrelated. Um, so for example, um, the rising food insecurity is uh, uh, could uh, lead to the collapse of ecosystem and global warming. Uh, as food insecurity increase, we might be more aggressive in the way that we um, farm protein. So uh, animal factory farming, for example, um, can generate substantial amount of runoff, both in terms of growth promotion antibiotics to uh, methanes uh, to impact on our ecosystem. So I think a lot of these are interrelated and it behooves us to think of tackling these problems, not in isolation, but, um, but together. Um, what we are concerned about is not, say, worrying about um, rising food insecurity per se, but we should think about the aggregate risk that all these problems pose to us. And what we want is to lower that risk. It might involve eliminating some of these issues by themselves, or it might involve lowering the probability any one of them would occur uh, collectively. So what we're looking for is aggregate um, elimination of risk and not just done in isolation. This is critical because I think as we look at pandemics um, and their, their um, increasing frequency and intensity, it's important to realize that our solutions to these uh, pandemics should not raise significantly the risk of other potential threats. Doing so would be, um, would be a net zero, would be a, would be a fool's errand. So, um, all of these um, existential threats, I think, share some common elements that would help us uh, tackle them, I think. Um, so, for example, many of these risks are recent. Uh, they're within the last 150, 200 years. Um, and at no point in the history of humanity had, for example, um, nuclear holocaust been possible uh, up until the advent of the atomic bomb. Uh, prior to that, um, a rogue state or a particularly aggressive state uh, can kill a lot of people. Genghis Khan, I think, killed a lot of people, but not on the same scale as a nuclear, um, all-out nuclear war between two um, nuclearly armed nations. Uh, likewise, globalization has made some of these um, threats more significant. Um, pandemics, uh, for example, are more dangerous precisely because of the ease of transportation. Um, so some of these are recent and they are also mostly man-made. Um, climate change being an obvious example. Again, in the history of humanity, we have never been able to have that level of impact on the global climate as we have been able to do since the Industrial Re Revolution. Uh, they are oftentimes uh, unforeseen consequences with good intention. So the use of growth promotion antibiotics in animal Farming actually made protein much more affordable, which allows for um, better nutrition for a lot of people. Some people have argued that the extension of life expectancy in the last 100 years in the United States really came about as the result of improved nutrition. Um, and part of that is that meat is so cheap. Um, and having cheap protein, animal protein, allow you to feed a lot of people cheaply. Um, Global uh, absolute poverty is now currently at the lowest level in the history of humanity. And that's a great thing. There are fewer people um, living on the margin of existence than there were 100 years ago. I believe currently it's about 10 to 15% of the world's population. And about 150 years ago, it's about 85 to 90% of the world's population lived in absolute poverty. And I think a great deal of that had to do with things like globalization. Factory farming, um, uh, consolidation of food production, those are all um, have great consequences, had good intention, but they also generate um, existential threats that um, were unexpected. Uh, these are also mostly one shot events. It's very hard to learn from existential event. If a asteroid were to hit us, 
um, the odds are really good that we're not going to survive to learn that lesson. So uh, one-shot events are difficult to appreciate their um, magnitude because by definition, we have never experienced them in our lifetime. Um, they also have great consequences, uh, let alone current generation or current existing sentient being. Existential threats also um, eliminate, they close off possible future people. So all the billions and trillions of people who would be alive in the next 50, 100,000 years are all gonna be gone if we are dead now. So if their well-being are taken into consideration, then an existential threat, the net threat is more than just harm to us, but also harm to possible goodness that would have existed had we not died. Uh, and the risks are not small. So we like to think that these risks are seem so far-fetched, but if you actually put them together, their aggregate risks are not nothing. So Michael Rees at Cambridge University put it, sadly, um, at a 50-50 chance that humanity will survive the 21st century. The Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford, taken into consideration all the existential risk, put the odds of us surviving into the 22nd century at 19%. To give you a sense of uh, what that actually means is, uh, think of it this way. Um, if a person is born today, um, 2100, 21 not would be uh, 80 years from now. So this person will likely live until the 22nd century. The probability of this person dying from a catastrophic existential event is 1500 times higher than the odds of dying from a plane accident. So if you worry about flying on a plane because you think the plane is gonna crash, existential event that will kill you, it's about 1500 times more likely. Uh, and as far as we know, we're actually not spending a lot of time and energy worrying about existential risk, even though they are significant. And even if the risks are small because of the consequences are so huge, uh, the calculation of how dangerous a risk is, an event is, is going to be a multiplication of the two event, the two value, values, the consequences multiplied by the probability of the event. And given the gravity of the events, even with small consequences, they should generate a end result that raise alarm for us. Um, uh, because they're one shot, they're extremely difficult to appreciate. Uh, market solutions to existential risk usually fails. Um, that's primarily because markets have incentive to pursue uh, responses that are profitable, but not necessarily good for us collectively. So here's an example of the development of antibiotics in the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, you can see that new applications for antibiotics have steadily declined. In fact, of the 18 top pharmaceutical companies in the world today, 15 of them have opted out of developing new antibiotics. And the reason is obvious, antibiotics do not make money, especially new, cheap, affordable antibiotics. They are precisely being sent and uh, marketed to people, to communities that are not gonna be able to pay a lot of money for them. On top of that, they're expensive to develop. And there's a huge risk that if the target bacteria were to mutate and then the antibiotics became uh, ineffective, then you basically lose all of your investment. So the high risk, low payoff, and um, on top of all that, they are episodic. You take antibiotics for a couple of weeks max, and then you're done. Uh, you want to develop drugs that are uh, chronic. You want people to be taking this drug like statin or SSRI for the rest of their lives. That's how you make money, not by selling drugs that are used for two weeks by poor people, uh, so that's one of the major reasons why antibiotics have not been a hot research area. And um, national boundaries usually get in the way of solutions of, um, of global crises. Um, to, to solve global existential problem, we need to coordinate across nation lines, and that is exceedingly difficult. Um, we can, the good news is we can do something a lot, uh, 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 we can do something about some of these existential threats because of the availability of new technologies. Um, the um, uh, emergence of um, a um, pathogen that is um, for a pandemic, we have at least an idea of how to go about tackling it from a biological point of view. That's not true 100 years ago. 
So this is something that um, I think it's a silver lining in some respect. We are ahead of the curve compared to people 100 years ago. They're also unidirectional in this sense. If I were to uh, prevent a nuclear holocaust so that people 100 years from now can exist, um, they can reciprocate my generosity. They can reciprocate my investment by definition because I'm going to be dead. So in some respect, preventing a future catastrophe is a very pure form of altruism. You are helping people out who don't currently exist and who will not have a chance to reciprocate. And that's not true for a lot of international coordinated rescue effort. If I were to go to Haiti and help um, population after a earthquake, presumably some of the beneficiaries can reciprocate the investment. That is not true for um, existential threats that are in the future. And that kind of pure altruism might make uh, anticipating and responding to existential threat particularly problematic. Um, I like to think of COVID-19 as a rehearsal of future threats. Even though it doesn't rise to the level of catastrophic threats or existential threats, I think it gives us a glimpse of what a global crisis looks like. Um, I can say without any hesitation that the disruption to some of the supply chain uh, had been completely underappreciated and unanticipated. Um, so if COVID-19 can do this to our, um, say, supply chain for uh, vaccine manufacturing, then other global um, uh, existential threat can have similar, if not more grave disruption. So the lessons from COVID-19 can help us prepare for other existential threat. This is why I think they're all, in some respect, interconnected. So let's talk about pandemic. So pandemic responses, when it comes to efficient responses, really you're looking at one most basic strategy, preparation. The, thing, the reason why preparations are absolutely critical is because time is of the essence. You wanna nip this thing in the bud as quickly as possible. And that means stockpiling things like PPE, other um, hospital equipment like ventilators, get them ready to go before a pandemic hits. You also need to have the infrastructure ready for vaccine um, development and manufacturing. So to have the capacity to chunk out enough vaccine to cover at the very least the hot spots in the world require building factories before there is a pandemic. If you wait until the pandemic hits, you're looking at a significant delay which raises both the risk, duration, and the intensity of the pandemic. You also want to have the ability of quickly mobilize specialists and personnel to hotspots. Here, some sort of a world health organization would be superbly important in order to mobilize people to put out the fire, so to speak. You want to have the firefighters available before a fire shows up. Now, just to give you, an, give you a hint of why we're so behind the eight ball on this one, the budget for WHO is actually I think about half, about 50% of the budget of Mayo Clinic. WHO does not have a huge budget and most of their member states are behind the bills. So they're woefully underfunded and they are currently our firefighters. Um, we also need to have overflow capacity, just basic things like having the space to put um, patients in. Uh, without overflow capacity, you're gonna have to do a lot of the responses on the fly. And we, you also want the population to be well-educated, to understand what it means when there is a pandemic, to understand what it means to go in lockdown, to work from home. All those educational um, uh, dissemination should be done before a pandemic. So I like to even think of it like the good old air raid drills, getting people ready to know where the area shelter is, to know how to respond if there is a, um, a bombing or whatnot. We don't do anything along those lines. We do active shooter drills, but we don't do anything about pandemic responses. All these preparations require political foresight and will, requires large scale collaboration across individual, across cities, across nations, um, across states and across nations, and also require us to think from the point of view of other regarding motives. That is not in a self-interested way, empathy. And I, one of the key points in this presentation is that all three faces systemic obstacles. By systemic obstacles, obstacles I don't mean like the technological problems that confront the, the development of vaccines, like, oh, how are we going to make this vaccine? Those are hard problems, no question about it. But those are not systemic problems. They do not come from 
uh, any system in the world that makes development of vaccines so hard. Rather, I want to argue that the way the world is, the way we structure nation states, our economy, our culture, all those things make confronting a pandemic particularly difficult. And unless we make some systemic changes, we are going to have a hell of a time trying to respond to a pandemic and other serious um, existential threats. So let's talk about foresight and will. Pandemics clearly cannot be tackled individually. You do not want uh, a pandemic to hit Massachusetts and have people running around like chickens with their heads cut off and try to fight this individually. For starter, you end up fighting the pandemic and everyone else around you. I think, again, this is a um, highly underrated part of a pandemic, which is that the threat of a pandemic is more than the morbidity or mortality of the contagion. It's also about the social disruptions that occur when there is a pandemic. When you start seeing other people not as possible allies, but as potential threats in a zero sum game. Those kind of harm, I think, um, is often underappreciated. And of course, at a um, state level, the interdependence of commerce, resources, information, all requires coordinated effort that cannot be done in isolation. So you need to have political leaders, you need to have national leaders in order to coordinate these um, uh, efforts. Preparations are going to be essential and they're going to be significantly expensive. And here I want to introduce the concept of invisible projects. And I, this is my term, I don't know if anyone else talks about invisible projects. It came about because I've been involved in a redevelopment project in Cambridge along River Street. Uh, River Street is about 0 0.6 mile, a little over half a mile. It basically is um, radio out along with Western F. And River Street is about to be torn up and redeveloped. Uh, the main reason is that we need to put in new sewer lines in there. Currently, there's one giant sewer line that takes all wastewater to Deer Island to be treated. And that's incredibly inefficient. Uh, so rather than doing that, we want the sewer line to take rainwater into Charles River and then sewer water to the treatment center. And that means digging up um, River Street and dragging up the old sewer line and putting new sewer lines in, putting new gas lines in. The reason I have been involved in this is because I'm the chair of the bicycle committee in Cambridge and I'm involved in the transportation part of the development, putting down new bike lanes. The project is budgeted for $25 million for 0 0.6 miles, which totally blew my mind. I could not believe it cost $25 million to do this project. So I actually asked someone who's on the city council, who's a friend of mine, and I asked her, I was like, why is it that it's so damn expensive to put in a couple of sewer lines and some bike lanes? It couldn't possibly be that expensive. And she said, one of the major problems is because um, the sewer lines that we currently have are about 75 years past their life expectancy. A lot of the associated um, infrastructure, like making sure the walls around the sewer lines are well supported and so on, have crumbled. If we've done this 75 years ago, it would be a lot cheaper, but we didn't do it. Now, why didn't we do it? Why didn't someone say, yeah, we got to fix the sewer line? The reason is because this kind of project is an invisible project. There's a high cost to it where the benefits do not um, occur in a obviously observable way. The benefits either come in the future. So if somebody did this 75 years ago, we would be grateful because we don't have to do this. Likewise, after you've done this project, after Cambridge has finished this project in God knows when, the street pretty much look exactly the same. It's like replacing the roof of your house. You don't actually get to appreciate it. It's invisible. It's not like you bought a jet plane and put it in the middle of Central Square. No, it looks exactly the same. And those invisible projects are exceedingly difficult to motivate from a political point of view. To give you another example, there's a major dam in Elwife that holds some of the brackish water, some of the seawater from going into our sewer system and also into our um, subway system. Given the rise of um, ocean level, that dam in Elwife is expected to fail in 2040. When that dam fail, salt water will seep into a red line and once salt water again to the subway system, it will be more expensive to replace the entire subway system than it is to repair it. So we need to fix that dam now to anticipate for a failure in 2040. We can't wait. If that dam is fixed and will cost millions and millions of dollars, 
no one in Cambridge will actually see a bit of difference. And it's really hard to raise taxes for invisible projects. And here's the reason why liberal democracies are particularly vulnerable to this kind of invisible projects. The cost on the constituents um, is high and the political benefits are either invisible or cannot be reaped within the term of the politician. So if you are a congressional representative, you have a two year term, uh, even if you successfully rerun again and again and again, some of these existential crises have expectancy of 40, 50, 100 years. Uh, that's not going to happen likely in your political career. So for you to impose a cost on your constituents for benefits that they might not understand that they might not reap is political suicide. Now, of course, if everybody does this, eventually somebody is going to be holding the bag. So the question is, how do we do this to make sure that we can have the foresight and have the leadership and the will to do this? Now, you might think if only my constituents are well educated enough to provide kind of a bottom up pressure to get leadership to do the right thing. One major problem with that is information consumption these days, voluntary, whatever that would mean, is highly segmented. We can all live in our little echo chamber and listen to information, news, political views that confirm our personal biases. There's no share value and informational um, bedrock. And as a result, it's, it's very difficult to have the coherence necessary at the constituent level to push politicians to do the right thing. Occasionally, you find places that have that will, Cambridge being a good example of that. Some of the smaller nations with more coherent cultural values tend to have a better chance of making this kind of grand move. But in a country like the United States, where not only are states within themselves fragmented, states themselves are politically fragmented, to do some sort of a coherent national response would be difficult from the bottom up. Um, I, I'm not gonna talk about perverse incentives in the sciences. I wanna make sure I get through all my slides, um, but you can just think of it this way. The problem of perverse incentives is not unique to politics and um, public responses. Scientists also have perverse uh, incentives. There's a reason why, um, for example, the replication crisis became, um, became a thing. Um, for those who don't know, replication crisis is essentially the phenomenon where lots of well-known clinical studies um, have failed to be replicated when we try to replicate the results. One of the major reasons is because no one is actually doing the scorekeeping. No one is checking someone else's work by replicating their studies in their laboratories. The reason is you don't get tenure by doing replication studies. So New England Journal of Medicine, I think had a number like 8% of their publications are actually replications. The rest of them are first shot. Uh, and New England Journal of Medicine made it very clear that they actually prefer novel studies rather than scorekeeping and score checking. And the result of that is there's a perverse incentive to steer people away from a key component of modern science, which is peer review. Uh, and that kind of perverse incentives does not need to require any bad actors. All it requires is that the system itself is designed such that the incentives gear a certain kind of outcomes that are not actually optimal for the rest of us. And I believe that from a liberal democratic point of view, you have the, exactly the same problem when it comes to existential and catastrophic events. How do non-liberal democracy tackle COVID-19? Some of us already are aware of this. So one thing that China did in late February, early March was to engage in massive lockdown that was unprecedented. So uh, I think by March, they have 760 million people in hard lockdown. Uh, you could not leave your apartment without a note. Um, and um, that amounts to about one fifth, is that right? Yeah, one sixth of population of China, which is unbelievable. Uh, in fact, at the height of global lockdown, you're looking at about 40% of the world population in some form of lockdown. But the lockdown in China was particularly aggressive. It was, they, had, they posted armies at roads to prevent people from driving out. Trains were shut down. Their lockdowns are not our lockdowns. Um, we could not do that here for very basic respect for individual liberty. 
They also engage in significant information censorship for better or for worse. Of course, the initial news of COVID outbreak was censored, which made uh, containing it much more difficult. But they also cracked down on uh, disinformation. And that helped to consolidate the message, which is extremely important when it comes to engaging a pandemic. You want to make sure that there is a clear, unified voice that telling people what they ought to do. And China was able to do that because they have massive control over um, internet, the flow of information in general. Singapore also adopted a fairly heavy-handed approach to um, COVID-19. Uh, they mandate temperature check for all their students in the university. So I don't mean just coming in. Professors have to take students' temperature before classes start and they have to report it. If they don't report the temperature, students are not allowed to be in classes. Um, there's jail sentence for people who violate stay-at-home orders. So a guy came back from overseas to uh, Singapore and I believe he went to a noodle shop down the street and took a selfie and posted on Instagram and he was promptly thrown in jail for violating the um, stay-at-home order. Uh, something as um, minor as standing too close to someone, uh, ignoring the six foot uh, distancing um, recommendation, warranted currently a $7,000 US dollars fine if you stand too close to someone. So these are fairly heavy handed approach that again would not work. Both reappropriation of private industries to produce PPE and other materials. Again, they could do it, we can do it because there's basic respect of um, commercial autonomy and, uh, and, uh, uh, and economic, um, uh, economic freedom. Uh, they also were able to pivot to do massive support that we can do. So for example, in Wuhan, they were able to build two hospitals that are about 366,000 square feet uh, in the course of 10 days. Not only were they able to mobilize the labor necessary in order to do this, they also ignore all disruption to ecological um, concerns, economic, social, local concerns. Just screw everybody, we're building two hospitals right here. Um, your disruption be damned. We can't do it here. So here's the philosophical dilemma. Uh, liberal democracy, I think, are good at tackling pandemics because we have informational transparency by and large. We're able to get information out in at least a more transparent way than a lot of closer um, political system. But the problem with it is that because by definition, we have weak executive power and we place premium on individuals' liberty, both of those things undermine coherent responses. So here's really the basic problem from a philosophical point of view. Can we have an effective um, politically led response to a pandemic while respecting the political values that we cherish in a liberal democracy. For me, abandoning the political values is also deeply unattractive. I don't wanna give up my privacy in order to increase our odds of um, battling COVID-19. Uh, yet, giving up our privacy is oftentimes critical in, for example, contact tracing. Uh, whether or not a response is adequate to COVID-19 or to any pandemic is not just a question of lowering the mortality and morbidity rates of the contagion. It's about the associated economic and social cost of our responses. So that's a very easy way to end COVID-19 right now. Super easy. We know the incubation period is about 14 days max. So what we can do is just force everybody to stay at home for 14 days. That's it. The whole world, if you can lock everybody in for 14 days, the pandemic will be over. We can do that for lots of reasons. The economic and social reasons are obviously exceedingly high. What are we gonna do? Let these people who are COVID-19 positive die in their own home? That seems morally unacceptable. And of course, philosophically, violating people's right to do some very basic things seems just wrong. So the question here is not how to respond to a pandemic. The question here is how to respond to a pandemic that is consistent with the values that we hold. That's the magic key. So large-scale collaboration, I wanna talk about why large-scale collaborations are so difficult, both at the individual level and at the um, national level. Um, hoarding, of course, is a terrible idea. Hoarding is a terrible idea in a pandemic because hoarding leads to inefficient distribution of resources. So let's think about 
the distribution of hoarding of vaccines, which the United States is planning on doing. We have already made, um, uh, we have already made, uh, we already signed contracts with major manufacturing firms to acquire a substantial amount of vaccines in this, for this country, regardless of our need. So that's a kind of hoarding behavior. Hoarding is a bad idea because you want to send the resources to the place that can use it most. Hoarding by definition does not do that. So, but from a rational self-interested point of view, hoarding is a great idea. If you're an American and you hoard vaccines, there might be an outbreak in India, but you sure are glad that you don't have a shortage of vaccines here. So here we have a case where rational self-interest conflict with collective outcomes. If each individual were to behave in a rationally self-interested manner, collectively we arrive in a suboptimal um, outcome for everybody. And this of course is the classic case of prisoner's dilemma. So voting is a great example of that. Voting is not in your rational self-interest uh, not in your rational self-interest to do in a national election. Um, so for example, if during the next election, um, should I bother to vote? Well, look, if my candidate wins, me standing in line in Cambridge for two hours being exposed to a potential contagion, it's not gonna make any difference. It's a national election. The state of Massachusetts is not gonna be decided by one vote. The odds of that are slim to none. I'm better off staying at home and not voting. Now, if everybody stays at home and not vote, should I bother to vote? If my candidate is not gonna win, should I bother to vote? Of course not, my vote doesn't matter. So in that respect, from a rational self-interested point of view, it doesn't make sense for me to actually vote in the national election. Now, prisoner's dilemma, for those who are not familiar with the game theoretic model, it works very simply. The cops actually do this. It's not just a thought experiment. This is actually a strategy cops use. So suppose you and your partner have both been arrested for um, bank robbery and the cops come to you and they tell you the following. They said, listen, we don't have enough evidence to charge you both with bank robbery, but we only have enough to charge you for weapon possession. I'll make you a deal. If you rat on your partner, we'll let you go scot-free and your partner would take the entire punishment. So if you rat and your partner doesn't say anything, you get zero year of jail sentence and your partner get 10 years. Now, you can both stay silent. We can only charge you with weapon. So that's two years for each of you. But we are also making this offer to your partner. If your partner rats on you, he gets zero year. And if you stay silent, you get 10 years. Now, of course, you can just both rat the living hell out of one another. In which case, it's not as bad as if you did the robbery by yourself. So you each get eight years, right? So from your personal point of view, this is the best place to be, then here, then here, and then here. Now the question is, what should you do? Suppose your partner stays silent and you're only interested in rational self-interest. You're only interested in minimizing your jail sentence. What should you do? If your partner cooperate, you get two years. I mean, if you cooperate with your partner, you get two years. If you rat on your partner, you get zero years. So if your partner cooperate, you're better off ratting on your partner. So defect. Now suppose your partner defect and rats on you. Are you better off cooperating or defecting? If you cooperate, you get 10 years. But if you rat your partner out, you get eight years. So you're still better off ratting out your partner. So no matter what your partner does, you're better off ratting out your partner. This is called dominant strategy. Now, of course, your partner is being offered the exact same deal. And your partner comes to the exact same conclusion that he should rat you out too. And what that means is rather than being in the upper right corner, upper left corner, where you're both cooperating and end up in a pretty good place, you end up ratting the hell out of one another and end up in a bad place. The entire industry of really political philosophy is how to get people to move from the lower right box to the upper left box. That's it. How do you get rationally self-interested individuals to cooperate? The standard solution to prisoner's dilemma is this. You identify the people who are ratting and you punish the living crap out of them. So if you litter, for example, we find you. 
even though littering might be to your rational self-interest. If I'm carrying around this sticky can of soda, I care about the environment, but I mean this, I'm, I'm never gonna come back to Northampton, chuck it out the window. It's easier for you. But if everybody does that, of course, Northampton and the world will be a worse place to be. So how do we get people not to litter? We find them, at least we threaten them, we find. Uh, in the voting case, we can do mandatory voting. That's what Australia does. Or we can do something a lot softer. We give you a little sticker to say, I voted. And what the sticker does is essentially shame all those people who don't vote into feeling bad about themselves. It's a form of very soft punishment. You identify the defector and you try to nudge them to the voting side. Uh, these solutions, of course, require identification of defectors and surveillance become a critical part. You have to know who is not playing by the rule. And that for a liberal democracy is a problem because it requires the state to look into your trash to see if you're recycling. And basic privacy requires us, respect for privacy might prohibit the state from doing something like that. Nations that have stronger sentiment of communitarian values tend to do better because they're not thinking as rational, self-interested individuals. They're thinking more of a community. And the stereotypes turn out to be true if you look in some of the healthcare surveys. Nordic countries do a much better job uh, solving the standard problem of prisoner's dilemma than the United States. Something as simple as this. Uh, should you go see your doctor um, if, you are, if you have a marginal health problem that probably would go away? In the US, the sentiment is, I pay for my health insurance, I'm going to the doctor, I'm using it. I think something like 80% of Americans said they would do it. In Finland, the number came back to about 14%. And the primary response, um, the qualitative response was, of course, I'm not going to go see a doctor if I don't need to go see a doctor. That's a waste of resources for everybody. Thinking in terms of that communitarian framework allows nations like fin Finland to do a better job motivating individuals to do things against their rational self-interest. So um, at a national state level, um, the incentive to act is primarily internationally. And this is from a philosophical point of view. It really comes from the concept of social contract. Why do we have a state? We have a state because we believe that I'm curtailing my rights in order so that you will curtail your rights and I form a social contract with you. And this social contract that we will lay down our arms and allow, for example, the police to take over public safety, it's our contract. I pay taxes, you pay taxes, and I would use the resources when I need it, and you would use the resources when you need it. But you don't get to use this stuff if, you didn't, if you're not part of this contract. So from a nation state point of view, acting on behalf or in the interest of other people by default violate this concept of social contract. Why should I help people in Cuba? They didn't pay taxes. So if they don't pay taxes, why should my resources go to them? And this is not just a question of selfishness. This is a question of violating the basic tenets of a social contract. We don't give things away for free because that's, they're not part of the contract. Worse still, on the international level, we lack the global authority to actually identify people who are not playing by the rules. We don't have anything like that. So the standard solution of prisoner's dilemma is identify the defector and then punishing them. We don't have that, so that solution now no longer exists. Worse still, because existential crises often involve these um, uh, events often involve future people, you also have prisoner's dilemma across temporal line. I'm playing prisoner's dilemma, not with my neighbors about whether or not um, I should put a mask on, but rather whether or not I should do something that benefit few people in the future. That kind of transtemporal prisoner's dilemma, it's probably even more difficult to solve. So here's my potential solution, and this is the, the end of the talk. I think that when it comes to prisoner's dilemma, we make a very basic assumption. That is, the actors are acting in a way that is self-interested, that rational self-interested individuals. If we can get people to act not in a rationally self-interested way, we may be able to shift the where we are from the lower right side of the grid to the upper left side of the grid. And how do we do this? We do this by, I think in one respect, spreading the myth of altruism. By myth, I mean sincerely that this is a myth. We 
propagate the idea that you ought to be altruistic. It's not because it's good for you. It's not because it's the rational thing to do. It's the same myth that we propagate when it comes to voting. We think you have a civic duty to vote, that you ought to vote, even though it might not be your rational self-interested, self-interest to vote. By spreading this myth of altruism, maybe we can undermine a key component to prisoner's dilemma, the kind of rational self-interested uh, motivation. So there are lots of examples that we adopted rational, uh, adopted altruism. Anti-littering behaviors. The odds of you actually being caught littering are slim to none, yet we don't litter. Littering is a rational self-interested behavior, but we feel a sense of shame when we litter. Why? It's from grade school. Don't be a little bug. Recycling, not rationally self-interested. Your contribution to the environment, slim to none. Let other people do the work, don't bother. Still, 35% of US households recycle. There are 35% of Americans who bought into this. American votes at over 50% in almost all national elections. And we vote knowing very well, now you do, that it's not in your rational self-interest to do this. Why? because we are essentially bought into this myth of civic duty. My wife actually used to teach first grade and during um, national election year, she would do mock election in the classroom. And I joke around and I was like, why do you do this? She said, you know, to get the kids in love with voting, that voting is important. I was like, you know, anywhere else that's called political indoctrination, it's, it's propaganda, but that's how we do it. Um, and most deeply respectful is the 2005 parliamentary election in Iraq, where um, insurgents were still blowing up polling, state, uh, uh, polling stations. 70% of Iraqi voted risking their own lives, knowing very well that the vote probably made marginal differences. Uh, I won't talk about the litter bug scenario. So what I propose to do is spread the myth of altruism. Now, how do you do this? One way you can do this is deploy what Richard Dawkins coined memes. So we all know what a memes is these days, you know, um, grumpy cats and all that. But the concept actually came from Richard Dawkins in his book, The Selfish Gene, 1976. The basic idea is that a meme is a unit of information. And you can think of a meme like the first four note of Beethoven Fifth Symphony, dun, 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 dun. Or you can think of it in terms of like a joke. It could be a long story, a joke. And what Dawkins identify is that natural selection actually doesn't restrict um, the phenomenon to the biological sphere. You could have natural selection in non-biological spheres. And all you really need are three components. You need replication, you need muta mutation, and you need competition. So long as you get these three things, you have natural selection. And memes can engage in natural selection. They replicate. So when I say dun 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 dun, for those who have never heard that, those four notes, it just replicated from my brain to your brain. It can mutate. A joke that I tell you, you might misremember the joke and mutate it. And some of these mutations might make the joke funnier. That happens all the time when you misremember the joke and the, your version is actually better than the one you heard. And of course, it's competitive because there's limited amount of physical space to encode information. Uh, a book, your brain, um, a piece of paper all require physical space since they're a finite amount of it, that's gonna be a finite amount of space. So some memes are gonna be more fit than other memes. Uh, and memes satisfy all these conditions. Uh, there's some memes that are good for your genes. There's some memes that are bad for your genes. Celibacy is a meme that is really bad for your genes. Catholicism, on the other hand, is really great for your genes. So they actually interact with one another. Uh, in that respect, I think spreading the meme might have a chance, the memes of altruism might have a chance of, um, of getting us to act as non-rational, self-interested individuals. I really like to think of it as almost like releasing NATO bot into the world, releasing uh, some corrective measure in order to counteract the rational self-interested nature of our decision-making. So, uh, social, uh, we, what we need when it comes to pandemic and really any massive um, uh, uh, existential threat is to realize that these are social problems that require social solutions. How likely is it that altruism, spreading altruism would actually solve these existential risks? Very unlikely. I have no doubt in my mind, this is very unlikely to work. But my claim is that it's probably going to be 
a better shot than any other ways we can in, um, in combating existential and catastrophic threats. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan, for that you know uplifting <laughs> talk. <laughs> <in this game. laughs> um, so we have a few minutes. Uh, Dan, would it be okay if you stayed a like ten minutes longer to answer some questions? Sure. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate that because there's usually a lot. Um, so let's see what we have so far. So A. David Lewis asked early in the talk um, when you were talking about the bang list, and he was wondering if there's sort of um, threshold points for these different catastrophes basically like a point at which of no return i guess is really what he's getting at yeah yeah i mean the the, the most obvious one of course is climate change um you know we have fairly compelling arguments that there are going to be or there had been there might be there are there are or uh, there will be uh tipping points where we just won't be able to undo the damages we have done uh and there are questions about whether or not those points are in front of us or behind us uh, and once that happens, it's really not about uh, avoiding the existential threat, but mitigating, moving from existential to catastrophic threat. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, to me, probably applies for a host of other um, threats as well. Um, uh, I do think that, for example, like the advent of, uh, you know, uh, offloading a lot of our tests to artificial intelligence might require us to lose more control of, um, of critical infrastructure. And if they're badly programmed, that could potentially create a problem that is a point of no return. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of existential threat, obviously they have never happened to us. They have happened to other species, not us. Mm -hmm. um, and all we have confronted so far in the history of humanity has been catastrophic, but not existential threat. But if recent history is any guy, these threats are becoming more frequent and more intense. Mm -hmm. So um, that to me is the most, um, most terrifying part. It's actually accelerating. They're, they're kind of like a feedback loop. They are um, uh, accelerating one another collectively. Mm -hmm. So like climate change increase, um, problem of water availability, which increase, which increase the probability of there being armed conflict so all those factors play with one another and that kind of echoing back and forth really worries me. Mm. And that's actually related to a second question that he asked, um, where he asked basically, um, what have been the odds of humans surviving previous centuries and whether that sort of changed since now, I guess the implication may be- Yeah, different. I mean, I think part of it is the power we have to alter our environment is mm. exponential, exponentially greater today than it was a hundred years ago. Uh, and I think, that kind of, um, given the fact that most of the existential threats are man-made, um, they lead to, I think, greater aggregate risk. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and also I think we are far more aware of the presence of this risk than we were a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, obviously global warming started when we started exhaling. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast is just, you know, when you realize that, wow, it's really getting a lot warmer these days. Siberia is melting. Uh, they point out the risk in a way that we could not have been able to identify 100 years ago. This is just, I mean, basic data collection. Um, and Dr. Ellis, our last presenter, she actually was asking when you were talking about sort of some of the the, the bad incentives <laughs> that we have in, the, in, in publication and science. And she was asking, are there any sort of committees that are tasked with um, dealing with this problem, but specifically she was ask, asking around the idea of, you know, the non-incentive to do replication studies. Yeah, yeah I think um, a number of professional organizations have urged publisher, by, by and large, is publisher being gatekeepers to a lot of the information and, you know, career kingmakers that, um, that can make a difference. So New England Journal of Medicine, I believe, have committed to publishing more replication studies rather than um, novel studies. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are universities that um, are trying to reform their tenure and promotion guidelines in order to uh, count um, replication studies as being just as important as novel mm -hmm. studies. Um, I don't know how much that's gonna make a difference because at the end of the day, what's going to matter is consumers are going to click 
on an article that has a sexy title and not one that is utterly boring. Uh, to click on one that says, you know, breast cancer gene identify, it's a whole lot more clickbaity than one that says, uh, exercise and good diet are still good for you. So, so long as in a liberal democracy with a free economy, we get to choose what we consume from an informational point of view, you're gonna start pulling the information in a way that's gonna affect what researchers do. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the issue. And I think like a lot of the problems you've been talking about, it's sort of the financial incentives, right? Because yeah. if that was removed, if there wasn't the incentive to need to get yeah. more clicks on it, then maybe that would, would sound, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I, and you know, and I am a advocate of free market economy. I think competition is one of the best way to drive innovation and drive efficiency. No question about it. However, I also think that, um, for example, state funded research that doesn't need to have immediate payoff to the sponsor, to a pharmaceutical company, it's critical in doing pure scientific research. But at the same time, if you're getting money, no matter what the outcome is going to be, uh, it will lead to some level of inefficiency. Finding that sweet spot between a purely controlled marketplace versus free market economy, finding that sweet spot that's consistent with our other values and other desire, that's the $64,000 question. Yeah. And uh, I actually had a question. Um, it's a little bit related to that. Uh, thinking again back to the coronavirus, um, looking at and thinking about sort of government responses, you actually see, um, especially in East Asia, very varying government systems, but largely successful um, outcomes. You know, China had problems initially, but in other provinces, they were able to get under control. Vietnam, a one-party communist yep. country, was a, probably one of the most successful countries. But then you look at, for example, South Korea, Japan, free market, liberal democracies. Yep. But they, they were able to get it under yep. control in similar ways. And, and what can we say? Is there something, I'm always a little skeptical yep. of cultural, um, you know, reasons, but is there something about? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, on one of my slides, I had a little note on the side. So one of the hardest thing, one of the most tricky part of this presentation, and this presentation is a start of longer project, is that to claim that political cultural factors come into play in terms of the success in combating COVID-19, um, it's required us to actually have a way to measure um, how severe COVID-19 is. Before we even start talking about how successful your mitigation efforts are, how bad is COVID-19 in your country? Mm -hmm. And that seemingly obvious public health data point is exceedingly hard to find. As you know, you know, caseload, pointless because it, it's relative to testing. Mm -hmm. Hospitalization, pointless. It depends on availability of healthcare. Case fatality rate, pointless. It depends on all the other social factors. How soon did the, uh, did the virus get there? Um, how, what the questions may be about different strain of viruses, whether or not that makes a difference. Unless we control for all those things, it is virtually impossible to calculate the exact um, severity of the outbreak. In fact, that's one of my, uh, my one of my front burner projects. And I would I plead with my public health colleagues to help me come up with a better matrix to measure the severity of a pandemic than what we have because it's just so hard. And this is I I am not an expert in this field, and this is super hard for me. Um, but without that number, without that kind of measurement, it's impossible to come up with empirical data to support my overall thesis. I am drawing from a lot more from behavioral um, philosophy than it is from hard public health data, which I des desperately need. Yeah, well, that's great. And that's actually probably um, a good idea for future webinars so we can really start to maybe talk a little bit about how, you know, what these measurements are that we use to assess yeah. the severity of a pandemic and how we start to understand them. Because I mean, one thing, even for me as somebody who teaches public health, I've started to understand that a lot of these things that we talk about, like the case fatality rate, we'd often talk about it like it's an element of the virus, but it's really not just an it's element not. of the virus. It's about, yeah. it's about the way the, uh, the systems that are in place to, to, right. to confront it. You live in a place with no health care, the case fatality rate is going to be much higher, but not and right. even if you have the exact same virus. So that's really Right. Important. And especially if you take into consider consideration, like the social disruption as being a part of your, of the contagion, part of the harm of the contagion, a country that has a large percent of the population already working from home, Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be far less affected than uh, one that have much more dedicated office culture. Mm -hmm. So how exactly do you quantify that and do you build it into the matrix? That's, that's great.
Um, so do one more question. So this is from uh, Tia Newberry. She asked, I'm just going to read it. How can we get healthcare professionals and scientists in positions of power to invest in these evidence-based solutions? Are there any political organizations at MCPHS that help present evidence to politicians and provoke um, long-term solutions? Yeah, I, um, I know that at MCP, we have organizations that do that. Um, a couple of the health alliances, um, the Global Health Alliance, I believe that's the name of it. Um, they do some of the work in advocating for evidence-based um, uh, solutions to some of these global crises. And I think that's invaluable. Uh, at the same time, I think it's also important for us to examine the kind of um, uh, hidden assumption, hidden values that we have when we talk about what is an adequate, um, what is an adequate response to a contagion. So for some of you who is up on the um, uh, mitigation effort, um, uh, Sikh Emanuel wrote a piece um, a couple of weeks ago or maybe a month ago in New England Journal of Medicine about um, how to ration ventilators. And so whenever you do any rationing, that's going to be a question about maximizing something. What is the goal you're trying to maximize? And for uh, Emmanuel, and this is kind of hidden in his paper, it should be front and center, but it's kind of hidden in one of the paragraphs. He said, what we're looking for is to maximize the number of life saves and the number of life year saves. Um, that seems trivially obvious, but there are obvious problems with that. I mean, take this one very clear counterexample. We know life expectancy of some people of color are lower than life expectancy of Caucasians. Should that be part of the factor? Should a 45-year-old African-American male and a 45-year-old Caucasian male, just looking at statistical life expectancy, should the African-American male receive a lower priority because he has a lower life expectancy? So if we're just looking at raw numbers, the answer is, of course. But that strikes most of us as so deeply unfair. Uh, the guy's already lost the natural lottery of being born in a world where having dark skin significantly curtail your life expectancy. And now you're going to be denied life-saving treatment because of this allocation uh, policy. So as we are confronting some of these um, crises, it is, it is critical that we understand some of the uh, hidden assumptions. And these assumptions, I'm telling you, are kind of like the cat's meow of the humanities. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> we, we identify the cultural, philosophical, economic, uh, assumptions, anthropological assumptions that guide a lot of our reactions. Yeah. yeah, and that seems like that's what this pandemic has done is it's made a lot of these conversations that might have been a bit more, seemed a bit more academic, even if they never really were completely academic, very, um, very real, right? And it's, uh, it's exciting, but it's also sort of terrifying that all these, yeah. and we don't always have the answers, and that's something that's particularly, yeah. can be uh, difficult to deal with, I think. Well, thank you again, uh, Dr. Dian Ho. We really appreciate this. I think this was a great talk. And like I said, you know, a bit of a different, different style of uh, uh, topic than we had from the last one. And there'll be the same thing when we move to Dr. Luca's talk um, in a few weeks. So I hope I'll see a lot of you there. We had over 90 people participating today, which is really, really exciting to see. And I'm sure there'll be even a lot more people that will be uh, watching the recording of this, because I think this is going to be really valuable, not just for this conversation, but just for people to watch into the future and sort of a document of what's happening now. So thank you. Thank everybody for attending. And I hope I'll see you all um, for the next talk. And feel free to email me with questions, suggestions, and help me out with some of the, my ignorance in this talk and, um, and future projects too, of course.